to you. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, I'm Colleen David. I'm currently product manager for personal care at CJP Chemicals. I've been with CJP for three months now. Um, this morning, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Ashley Bannister. Ashley is currently the procurement executive Thank at CJP at Chemical. Chemical. Um, and, and sorry, Bridget, there's some um, Yeah, I don't know who's, um, Mark is on the, are you close to Ashley? It might be, no. is that speaking? Oh, not, okay. So All right, but um, guys, if we can keep the, the microphones on mute, I'll just check who's unmuted. And two questions at the end, if you don't mind. I think it is Ashley's microphone. It's so strange. Sorry, Colleen, because everybody else is on mute. <laughs> <laughs> so it might be Ashley. Yeah. Can Can you guys hear me? We can. Yes, we can, we can hear you now. Okay. okay. So just before we get started, guys, a few house rules. Um, so Bridget is recording this session. Please can I ask that we keep questions to the end, or you're welcome to pop it into the chat. <laughs> And just if there's any topics that you would like us to cover in this lecture series, please just um, pop it into the chat. Okay, Ashley, over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, and hi to everyone. Um, obviously, I don't spend a lot of time with the COSCHEM people, but um, I hope that I can provide some insight for you guys in terms of uh, supply management. Um, if we look at today, I just want to cover or do a general introduction. Um, I want to then spend some time going over some of the sourcing challenges that we've seen in the industry um, in the past and, and what the learnings or the takeouts were of that. And then obviously what's happening in the industry right now and what we could then um, do to de-risk our, our businesses or our supply chains, um, but at the same time manage costs. Um, as I go through the presentation, obviously I'm, I'm not an expert on everything, but please feel free to ask questions. Um, I, I might not because I'm presenting see the hands that are up, so maybe Colleen, if you can just keep a check and then let me know if there are questions during the presentation. Yes, I will do. Okay, perfect. All right, so if we look at um, the South African cosmetic industry, it's probably um, one of the largest and most dynamic on the African continent. Um, it's very multifaceted. Um, and also we, we probably try to target quite a, a wide um, target audience or, or range of markets, um, but certainly do offer skincare, makeup, hair care, fragrances and toiletries. Skin care and probably makeup and hair care being the largest um, offerings that we see uh, in South Africa. And there are quite a few companies that also target uh, up into the rest of Africa and even some exporting up into Europe. Um, this diversity obviously brings its own challenges in terms of how we explore the South African market and how we want to market our product offerings to our specific customer needs. Um, and then if we look at the disruptions that we've had during COVID, the wars post-COVID, and some of the shipping crises that we've had to go through, this obviously further complicates the situation um, when we consider how we want to, to get our product and manage the cost and take it to market. So if we, we look at where we've come from, um, I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about COVID. We all know what we went through. We all know about the lockdowns and the restrictions that we had. Some countries um, locked down much harder than other countries. Um, but I think the big take out of that was obviously the restriction of movement and the inability to process or handle containers and cargo um, throughout the world. And as we had these restrictions with people being not being able to move or ports not being able to process cargo, um, these created shortages. If we looked at just before COVID, people were paying probably about 650 to 700 US dollars per 20 foot container. And then at the peak of COVID, prices went as high as $10,000 per um, 20 foot container. So this obviously had a significant impact on the cost of product and I'll, I'll break it down a little bit later. 
companies and consumers obviously during COVID started to panic buy because the, the lead times were significantly longer, but many times you couldn't even get cargo shipped. Uh, or if, if uh, that country where you sourced from had severe lockdowns, you didn't even know if they would be able to process the material and, and that would impact your business. Once COVID had come and gone, rates fell sharply. So your shipping rates came down from 10,000, started dropping significantly back down to the $1,000 levels. Um, but not only that, chemical prices, if we take some of the big commodities like citric acid, your stearic acids and products like that, um, I think citric was over 2,000 during COVID, $2,000 a metric ton, but then dropped down to around about the $900, $800 level within the space of two months. The problem that you had was that many of the companies had obviously bought significant levels of stock because they needed to, to get through the supply chain challenges during COVID. And so many, many uh, country, countries and companies had huge amounts of inventories which they were still sitting on post-COVID. Um, and many of these materials were still at significantly higher prices than what was being offered in the spot market. Um, and so we ask ourselves, why are we talking about COVID? How does that impact us now in our supply chains? Um, some of the takeouts for me was it, it taught us that we needed to have uh, an important um, look at how we managed our risk and also how we sourced our materials or our products for our companies. It further exaggerated the long lead times from sources overseas and being in South Africa, unfortunately, probably 95% of the product that we source, we have to import from overseas. We don't have the benefit of having a huge um, manufacturing market for chemicals in the cosmetic industry here in South Africa. So these exaggerated lead times um, put our companies at risk. And even during COVID, some of the companies had to close doors. It highlighted how reliant the world is on maritime for the movement of cargo, sea freight being the cheapest method of moving cargo over large uh, distances. It also highlighted the significant impact that shipping can have on products and how important it is to manage this aspect of one's finished product. And again, I'll share a costing with you or a, a little breakdown of a cost with you now. Um, but many companies post COVID um, started looking at risk management and how they would um, build a risk mitigation plan. So some of the big multinationals, we had like three or four of them who had contacted us and they looked at besides um, having the imported material for the South African operations, they started contacting some of the local trading uh, businesses and looked at models on how they could have certain amounts of stock maybe 20, 25% supplied from the local distribution arms so that they could de-risk their business and not be 100% reliant on, on imports over the sea. Um, so if we just look at the shipping costs, uh, I said I'd look at it. So if you look at pre-COVID, if we take a, we were paying on average $700 for a 20-foot container. Let's assume that we import uh, about 20 tons in that comp container of a product. Then, based on the $700, it would cost us $35 per metric ton or $1.04 cents per kilo. And we take the current exchange rate of about 18 and we convert that to Rand. It's roughly 72 cents per kilogram for just the shipping portion of the product that we're bringing in. If we look at during the peak of COVID, product went up to 10,000 for shipping. So if we assume again 20 tons in that container, that cost jumped from 35 metric uh, $35 per metric ton to $500 per metric ton. Um, and if you look at the RAND value, if we use 18 to the, the dollar, we went from 72 cents per kilo roughly on shipping to 9 RAND per kilo on shipping. So you can see the significant impact that your shipping rate can play on a product. Obviously, if you have a high value product, um, then that that number tends to get diluted a little bit, but it's still, when you have significant movement like this, can play a, a very big impact in terms of the cost of your product and maintaining a competitive product in the marketplace. Um, if we look at the current situation, and I'm going to talk about that a little later, but if you look at the current situation in, in the world at the moment, there's another shipping crisis we're going through. 
And again, shipping rates have moved from about one one seven five or one thousand two hundred dollars per container. And right now, this week, they're trading at around about five thousand five hundred. Um, so you can see again co the cost of con uh, shipping um, over the sea has more than doubled. So that's going to have a significant impact on the cost of material that we import. But I think more importantly, some of the challenges we're having is, is just physically being able to get some space or even get a sailing from the different regions, especially out of the east, out of Malaysia, out of um, Japan, out of China. Um, those are big challenges for us at the moment. So post the COVID crisis, um, we've had some other significant incidents or, or uh, milestones, which have also impacted the, the logistics and the supply chains. And the first significant one was the war in between Russia and Ukraine. Obviously, the Ukraine area is a, a area which is quite rich in, in feedstocks. So um, if you look at your sunflower production, you look at your corn-based products, uh, you look at phosphate-based products, there was a significant uh, contribution from this region for the world chemicals. And once the war had started, this created massive shortages in those areas, um, which had would then have a run-on effect in terms of certain raw material prices, and on some phosphates even uh, create shortages or um, cause countries not to export their phosphates because of the limited supply. Um, the other big impact that you had was the gas prices. Russia had obviously supplied significant amounts of gas into um, uh, nearby Europe. Um, and now with the restrictions and uh, the, the sanctions, etc., cetera, um, gas became a big issue. If we look at the cosmetic industry here in South Africa, I think many of us still rely on European producers for um, our input chemicals. And so uh, this, this drove again the cost of the product um, where we saw significant prices in gas. Many of the European uh, countries even had to go on gas, uh, gas rationing um, in order to manage the situation because they weren't sure about how it would impact them um, 12 months down the line after the embargoes were put in place. So this played a role in driving costs and the availability of material again. The other significant um, milestone was obviously the, the conflict in between Hamas and Israel. Um, and more recently, the Houthis getting involved and starting to target uh, shipping vessels. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't get a lot of airtime on the news, um, but if I, in the research I was doing just last week, two vessels were actually sunk in that area, um, three sailors losing their lives. So um, we don't always see that on the news and, and what's happening there, but there are a significant amount of attacks on commercial vessels that traditionally would have sailed through the Red Sea um, and, and have a shorter route to get to Europe from the east. What's happened now is that's forced the shipping companies to go around the Cape of Good Hope. So that significantly increases the lead time um, and that then has run on effects where it creates shortages and restrictions and also drives up the cost significantly. Um, I've just put up a slide here, one that I presented to our company at a conference earlier this year. And on the map, you can see that if you take from the west coast of India, Traditionally, the Green Line vessels would, would go through the Red Sea and then go up towards Europe, and that would take around 22 days based on if a, a vessel was sailing at about 12 and a half knots. Now, what's happened with all the tax and, and the, the companies being reluctant to go through the Red Sea, they have to now go around the Cape of Good Hope, so your lead time has grown from 22 days to 37 or 40 days. So a much longer lead time to, to deliver cargo to Europe and to the, the areas around Europe. Um, but more significantly with this uh, decision, we're also now starting to see some imbalances in terms of containers. So containers piling up in, in certain areas and we're not able to get them back to their point of origin um, as quick as we would in the past. So this starts to create uh, some shortages with, with containers and then affects the vessel um, sailing times as well. So 
the takeouts for me basically on this side is the access to feedstocks could be curtailed if the vessel availability is restricted. The three big shipping lines, MSC, Maersk, and Hapag Lloyd, have all decided to divert their cargo um, around the Cape of Good Hope rather than risk running through the Red Sea. Um, and so we, we see the increase in the, the freight rates and the, um, the container prices. We're also seeing a lot of what we would call blank sailings or um, shipping lines missing the, the, the shipping from a specific port. Um, yeah, so let me just spend some time talking about that. I met with MSC just before the crisis started to happen. And yeah, it's a bit frustrating that the the world is reliant on on some big companies like this, and the, there's obviously a limited amount of them. But um, I, I hard to say that it's nasty. There, there's no real big interest um, for them to try and urgently solve the problem because obviously now for a shipping container they can fetch instead of one thousand one hundred and seventy five, they can fetch five thousand five hundred. So um, they make significantly more money in terms of um, cargo that they ship, but um, that impacts all of us at the end of the day. Some of the big shipping lines also have a number of vessels that are in um, for maintenance because there, are, there is some legislation which requires them to be compliant from a green uh, perspective and um, their impact in the, the ozone layer, et cetera. It's just that it's quite convenient that many of those vessels are in for maintenance as well, which further drives the shortage of containers or the sailings available, out, especially out of the east into Europe. Um, so, yeah, so we, we, we have another significant, um, let's say, crisis or, or decision-making process that we've got to look at in terms of how we get our cargo from the different areas in the world down to, to, to South Africa. Something else that's played a significant role is that um, China manufactures a lot of electric cars and they traditionally used to export a lot of those vehicles to South America and American markets. Um, as of 1 July, there was a, a, a tax imposed on these, these products. And so we saw many of the Chinese companies trying to take up available containers before the 1st of July and get the cargo shipped so that they could beat the, the um, taxes that have been imposed. So this has further driven a significant or a huge demand for containers and space on vessels, which has now created even bigger shortages out of the, the East. So we take the, what are the takeouts from this, this crisis? Um, obviously, we're seeing a lot of port congestion and bottlenecks. So now, because... Um, people are trying to, to get cargo, um, there's a significant bigger volume, and so the larger, larger ports are having to process more containers. The turnaround time in, in working these vessels and getting these containers off the ships and emptying these containers is now um, increasing, and then along with that on some uh, big ports around the world, we also have certain inefficiencies, and this also contributes to it now because you have a bigger load um, or a bigger demand on containers and, and shipping. This creates the container shortages and there's an imbalance. So you might find right now that there's a significant amount of empty containers in the Americas. Now we've got to face the problem of how we get these containers back to their origin, which is in the east. Um, where we can ship chemicals or back to Europe where we can ship uh, product again. So, uh, and, and again, with limited vessels to take these empty containers back because we're under so much pressure to move cargo, um, some of the shipping lines may not move all of these empty containers immediately, and that further drives the, the shortage. Again, as I, I put up in the, the illustration before the slide, you, you've got a, a lead time that's gone from 22 days through to 37 days now, and sometimes as long as 45 days um, on shipping. And the freight costs have gone now in this, let's say, since I think it was about uh, middle of May, it's gone from about $1,200 for a 20 foot up to $5,500. And for some companies, you will see that it's a major challenge to have hazardous goods shipped. Um, there's even less space available and, sh and less containers available to ship Haskem. So the prices for Haskem, I think, is somewhere around six and a half thousand dollars 
the container at the moment. What this has uh, created is panic buying. So if you look at Malaysia and we talk about steric acid specifically or, or your fatty acid based products, um, when palm kernel is coming down and pricing should be coming down, we're seeing that the pricing is actually moving in the other direction. And that's mainly as a result of Europe panicking, longer lead times where they purchase their material from Malaysia or the East. Um, and so now they're buying more stock because they have increased lead times and they have limited sailings to get the cargo to, to Europe. So there's a bigger demand um, and this is basically driving the pricing at the moment. Um, and with this panic buying, obviously that takes up space. Some guys, when they panic buy, they prepare to pay $5,000 or $6,000 for a container, whereas some other companies will, may say, well, you know, we don't want to go that high. It has a significant impact on the finished product. Um, but yes, there are guys out there who are prepared to pay that kind of price uh, for the containers. And then obviously the shipping lines will give those guys first option to, to ship the cargo. So that creates further shortages. Any questions so far? There's nothing in the chat, uh, Ashley. Okay. Yeah, thank you. All right. Okay. All right, so if we look at de-risking options, um, and again, this is something that um, we as a procurement team look at, or a supply chain uh, team. Um, but I think it would be wise for a company to look at uh, or consider shipping from alternate ports and continents. So something that we did post-COVID already was that if we had a certain material, and I'll use steric acid because everybody understands steric acid in the cosmetic industry. Um, let's say we traditionally sourced it from Malaysia. We would potentially um, say, okay, well, let's look at a different continent in case we have challenges out of Malaysia. So can we source it from India or could we potentially source it from Indonesia or other regions? So that may be a strategy that you want to look at and, and approve a second source um, so that you're not only reliant on one continent or one port. And if we have a, a logistical uh, or a supply issue, then we are cut off from our supply. Secondly, I think it's important in this modern day to get a little bit closer to the company who does clearing for you or your shipping of your cargo. All of these companies can offer digital tracking of your orders. Um, that gives, and these digital tracking tools give you good insight in terms of what your average shipping lead times are. It shows you whether your, your cargo is transshipped. If your cargo is being transshipped, it will also show at which ports there's significant delays. Um, there's some very good tracking tools out there um, which can give you a lot of background information um, and help the teams, your procurement teams and your supply chain teams to make better decisions in terms of how you build your lead time and also how you ship your cargo. The big thing for many of the South African companies is obviously that we, we take cargo on a transshipment. So it's, it, it doesn't always sail directly to us because there's a higher cost for that. And being in South Africa or in Africa, cost is always a very serious consideration in terms of the raw material we bring in. Also, what I would recommend is we work a lot closer with the key material suppliers that we have approved for our products. Um, many of these suppliers can assist us with uh, market intelligence, what the feedstock pricing is doing, or whether there's going to be a shortage on the feedstocks, or whether there will be challenges from that perspective. Um, and that will help us also make better uh, decisions in terms of how much inventory we carry, what our lead times are, etc. Also, look at having alternate shipping strategies and contracts. As a company, our company um, is part of a buying consortium, so we negotiate preferential rates directly with some of the shipping lines because as a consortium, we move a significant amount of containers into South Africa. The problem we've had is that that contract has been with one specific shipping line. And I think it's very, very important in times, especially times like this where um, the rates go so, so much higher or they more than triple that you have an alternate shipping company that you could speak to or that you look at a strategy where you develop one of the smaller shipping uh, companies besides the larger company that you use to ship your cargo so that you, you bring the risk down in terms of getting cargo 
move towards South Africa. Also, I think it's important to consider other means of transportation. Obviously, like I've said, uh, shipping is one of the, uh, or sea freight is one of the most um, cost effective and cheapest uh, methods to move cargo. Um, we could also look at air or courier, um, rail as well, which is, is not very popular here in Africa or in Southern Africa. But I think it's important to look at other options so that you understand what that cost model is and how it impacts your product and that you do have a backup uh, as opposed to the sea freight and, and when we have challenges with sea freight. And then also as a procurement team or a supply chain team in the different companies, have a risk mitigation um, process where you look at what your alternate sources are, whether you consider that if you have need to carry more inventory um, and how you increase your lead times and what the impact that will have on your company and the working capital of the business. I think something in terms of alternate sources, it's always easy when you look at some commodities um, to look at alternate sources. But when we come to cosmetic active ingredients, it's not as simple. But one example sits out in my mind. There's a, a customer that we have in South Africa, and obviously they've approved a manufacturer. Now with COVID and some of the, the challenge we've had with the, the war in, in the Ukraine and Russia, their active ingredient, the, the feedstock for that's not available anymore anymore. They've now, uh, as a reaction, had to approve an alternate source, but it has an impact on the, the efficacy and, and the, the performance of the finished product. And for me, when I look at it, I think you'll see a little later, I'll talk about we need to get closer as a company, a cosmetic uh, development company, we need to get closer with the procurement team or the supply chain team and the development team, because you've got to look at these kind of um, alternate strategies. I know it's great to develop a product and, and it's got great claims, etc. and you based it on one manufacturer's active ingredient because of the claims, etc. that you can make. But we're seeing a world that's a lot more disruptive. We're seeing a world where there's a lot more supply chain challenges and I think they will continue. I think if you look at what's happening in the US now with the president uh, presidency, um, depending on who wins, there are differing opinions in terms of what their relationship will be with the East, but that'll have fallout for us in terms of our supply markets, etc. So we're going to have disruptive markets going forward for the next foreseeable future. So I think it's very important when you develop your product that you develop a product that's robust and that it does have alternates for you in case there are supply chain dis disruptions. Um, so important considerations in the cosmetic industry, um, like I was just touching on now, when you look at the development of the product, um, you, you certainly have got to consider what the alternative sources are. Um, if you're going to put your, all your eggs in one basket, what is the risk? Can you afford that? If you can't get that product, will it kill your brand? Will it kill your, your, your company? Will it kill the, the product itself? You've got to look at it from a commercial uh, aspect, not only a development and a, and a product quality aspect. Um, the other thing for me too, when you're developing the product and why I, I suggest you work closely with your, your logistics or your procurement team, is that you look at the consolidation of material from common suppliers. Something that I come across quite often is that a customer will develop a product because it has a very unique offering, but you'll only use 20 kilos every six months or so. And then you, you may have a whole basket of goods, but you'll, let's say you have 10 different products, but you have 10 different supplies for 10 different active ingredients, and each of them you're only buying 20 kilos. So that drives significant cost because you only bring in small packs Often you, you have to then consider whether you have to write off the balance if you don't use the full amount. Um, also, the, the shipping cost of shipping 20 kilos versus shipping maybe five tons or, or a full container load is, is significantly different. So it may be better sometimes when you do your development work to work with one or two um, significant players in the active ingredient um, or in the market that supplies certain products but that will allow you to consoli consolidate materials and thus drive the shipping costs and, and manage those costs and bring those costs down. It'll also give you bigger leverage or larger leverage with those, those uh, manufacturers 
So in times of shortage, etc., you've got more buying power or more leverage with them in terms of ensuring that you lock down your supply. We're seeing lots of raw material shortages. I think it's also important, we often we develop products and then when we launch a product and we take it to market, we have a purchasing team, but they just, they're more like an admin team and they just go out and they buy the, the raw material and they make sure that it's there for production. I like to, to put a lot of pressure on the procurement team that they understand the feedstocks. Uh, within our team, we do what we call category plans. These category plans forces the different buyers to look at the raw materials they're buying, understand what the feedstocks are, who the major producers are in the world, um, what factors drive the cost up, what factors drive the cost down, what the potential risks are and the supply areas, et cetera, so that your buying team is a lot more strategic and and they look at it more from a risk per perspective to make sure that uh, the business interests are protected for the raw materials that they got to source. I think it's also important for you to consider your supply chain visibility. So understand where your cargo has been uh, manufactured. Then does it get road freighted to the, the nearest port? Do they only ship from one port? Are there alternate ports that you could ship from? What is the nearest airport if you need to air freight? And like I said earlier, does the product get uh, transshipped? Um, if it does, which are the traditional ports that it gets transshipped through? What is the impact in terms of the layover when it gets transshipped, et cetera? The more you understand about your supply chain visibility, the more you're going to be able to put um, contingent plans in to, to bring the risk factor down. Then if I spend some time talking about small quantities and the related shipping costs. So something that we do is obviously we look at the shipping method um, and often we have customers because of their small volume, you've got to air freight the product out for them. Um, and then in times like this where, where rates uh, double or triple, that hurts them quite a lot and it hurts their end product. Um, something I think we all should consider is consolidating shipments. So um, potentially if you bring product out of Europe, have a consolidation point in Germany. And if you have three or four suppliers, you all send your cargo to one point. It's consolidated into a full container load. The same if you have a number of suppliers in Italy or in um, I don't know, the UK or France, you consolidate and then you're able to, to fill your uh, full containers and then ship the product out as opposed to air freighting 20 kilos at a time. Obviously, um, I think the big thing is for some of the, the manufacturing companies to align with some of the bigger distributors and traders that you have in South Africa because they can offer this model for you if they move a significant amount of containers out of Europe. Um, and that can help drive your cost and, and manage your cost uh, of your, your products that you bring into South Africa. The other option is also to obviously um, do buying consortiums. You may want to consider buying consortiums for from a shipping perspective. I find very few people are doing buying consortiums from, from a manufacturing perspective. So, you know, two or three manufacturers of cosmetic products getting together and saying, look, we buy similar products, let's all consolidate it together or something like that. It's more um, consortiums where you want, to you want to get together to maybe negotiate a preferential shipping rate or a preferential shipping contract and things like that. But these are options which... Um, especially in an industry where we tend to buy smaller volume active ingredients for our cosmetic products, um, we should be looking more and more at some of these solutions to help drive our cost. And I think in closing, for me, it's crucial that um, when we're developing cosmetic products that we, we work quite closely with our procurement and our supply chain team um, to develop the product. And I would go as far as to say, as we're looking at a new project, uh, I would suggest the R&D team sit around the table with the active ingredients. And I, and I keep mentioning active ingredients because generally those are the products that, that are smaller volume, not the, the commodity-based uh, um, other ingredients in the product, but it's more the active ingredients that are smaller volume. So it's important to sit around the table with the R&D team understand the concept that you want to develop or the concept that you want to take to market and what the sort of ingredients are 
and then not only looking at the, the efficacy of the product or the quality of the product and the claims of the product, but also looking at the supply chain aspects of the product and how the different decisions that you would make would uh, impact your product so that you can build a product that, that ensures you have long-term sustainable products in the market and that don't undergo significant hits from the different obstacles that we're seeing in the supply chains. And that's don't know if there's any questions. So actually, we have a question. It's just wondering how the average Joe finds a buying consortium. Are there platforms for this or word of mouth? Yeah, so uh, I, I would say it's quite difficult. I would, again, like I said earlier, contact uh, if you have a preferential distributor. Um, remember, your, there's quite a few distributors here in South Africa who have significant volume that they can import. So maybe sit down with them and partner with them in terms of what what options are available um, to, to get into a consortium. I suppose I would also suggest maybe forums like COSCHEM, where you have a whole lot of like-minded people who get together. Maybe at next COSCHEM, um, uh, what do you say, conference or whatever, you have a roundtable discussion with like-minded companies who, who have certain topics or certain um, issues or, or obstacles that they want to address and how do they get a consortium together to try and tackle some of these issues. Thanks. Um, are there any more? So the next question is, what do local companies look for in terms of locally manufactured actives? if one has a technology in place and security of a local feedstock? Uh, well, um, I suppose I don't have that much experience in terms of that. You would have to ask more of the R&D and development guys yeah, around the table. But for me, um, there's very limited um, producers in South Africa of active ingredients, uh, specifically for the cosmetic industry. Uh, there's probably a handful that can offer active ingredients for the cosmetic industry. So, um, yeah, I still I firmly believe, and I may be wrong, that you're going to have to import probably 80 to 90 percent of your active ingredients from Europe. And there's a very limited offering from the local guys. The local guys, if they are available for the product that you have, I certainly would look into it and maybe you know, continue to buy at least 10 to 20% from the local guys so that you keep developing them, you keep investing in them so that they can also invest in themselves, that they, they provide a quality product. Um, and that, for me, from a, from a procurement perspective, you've always got to remember, look at your supplier market. We tend to sometimes work with only one supplier, and what that happens is that the rest of the market loses interest and so they fall away. Before you know it, five years down the line, you have a sole source situation because you haven't developed the rest of the competition in the market, which would help drive your pricing. So I think it's always important to look at the considerations. And so if you have local producers, I would encourage also supporting them so that that market can grow. Um, obviously, you still need to manage the cost and they must be in line with what overseas guys can produce. But your procurement guy should be very mindful about developing a market which has a number of players who can offer the same product, because ultimately that will imp that will impact you as a, a consumer or a buyer of those raw materials, and you don't want a single source situation. I don't know if that answers the question. Thanks. Um, are there any more questions? There's nothing else in the chat. Yeah, so actually, I think you've answered both the questions. Um, so we just have some comments. It was very informative. Thank you from Yurinda, the COSCAM president. It's a pleasure. So, um, yeah, it doesn't look like there's any more questions. So, Ashley, I'd just like to say thank you. Thank you for your time and your valuable insights on this topic. We really appreciate you doing the lecture this morning. And thanks, everybody online. Thank you for joining. Um, Bridget, is there anything else? So actually, there's just a lot of thank yous. Okay. It's an absolute pleasure. Um, yeah, and I think uh, just on the topic of the crisis we're going through now, 
many shipping companies are saying we should see this crisis till the end of the year. Um, although my personal opinion is that now that the, the electric car tax is in place and the rush for that cargo to be shipped is gone, we may see a downturn or a normalizing of the shipping. But most cars are saying till the end of the year there's going to be a, a challenge with shipping cargo. But thank you very much for the opportunity, guys. Yeah, thank, thank you, Thanks, Colleen. Sorry, my, I was battling to get my microphone unmuted. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Sure. Very informative and, uh, yeah, lots of different challenges that, that everybody has to deal with. Uh, but I think it also helps to know that you may be not alone. <laughs> so thank you, yeah. mm, Appreciate it. All right, guys. Okay. Oh, thank you, Colleen. Cool. Thanks, Ashley. Have a lovely day. Thanks, thank everybody. you very Thanks, much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.